Welcome everyone to the third iteration of the programming lab for machine learning. In today's exercise, we will program a logistic regression. So on the lower right here, you see um, a depiction of the BGD algorithm. And the ultimate goal of today's exercise is to implement this algorithm with all its components and solve a real world regression task using it. And so we will build it from the ground up and first have a look at all the little components that we need. For example, we need the model function y of x right here. We need some way of computing the loss. We need some way of computing the convergence function. So this notebook is structured so that we can step through all of these different components and then assemble them at the end into the BGD algorithm. So the first and uh, also one of the most important parts is the model function. And as you know from the lecture, the model function is just the normal model function that you know from linear regression. So we multiply a rate uh, vector by the feature matrix. And then we uh, use a sigmoid activation function um, to turn this signal into a 0, 1 scale signal that we can later on interpret as probability. So the first task for us is to implement both this sigmoid function depicted here and the model function itself. So we'll first start with the sigmoid function. This is rather straightforward. Um, we just need to implement the formula as it's written there. So one divided by, one, don't forget the brackets here, because divided is uh, binding more than plus, one plus the exponent of minus z. And so this is the numpy function that computes uh, this e to the power of minus z. Okay, um, wait, let me start the kernel really quick so we get a fresh slate. Okay, now we have our sigmoid function. The second thing we need to implement is our model function. And again, here we can implement um, exactly what the formula says. So we have some sigmoid function, which we defined here. And uh, don't worry that this inside the sigmoid function is in fact not a single number, as you would might expect for this z, but an uh, array or a vector of numbers. But since we used numpy functions in here, this is trivially um, parallelizable. So if we use the sigmoid function as we implemented it here and apply it to the product of this inner computation, it will actually apply the sigmoid function to every element of our vector. So we can, without doing any further adjustments to our code, just use the uh, built-in numpy capabilities here um, to extend this to our vectorized uh, version of data. So in there, we have originally uh, x, the dot product between x and uh, w. So here we have the x given and the w given, and we will write it as x dot w dot t. Um, this is the other way around than you see it here. However, since I already use this dot t here, I probably could also do dot x. Um, so if you imagine this outer part not being there, but I find that this looks a bit confusing. Also, I rather write it the other way around as x dot w t. Okay, so now we also have our model function. The next part is um, the loss and the loss is used to quantify the error that the model makes um, because we want to improve this error. So we need some, some way to, to measure it. And you might ask here why we don't just use the actual performance or uh, effectiveness metric that we use to evaluate our model later, for example, accuracy here. Um, and as already mentioned in the lecture, I guess, um, we need a loss function that's derivable because we need to have the derivative of the loss to compute our gradient. And so we cannot, cannot use accuracy here because the formula for accuracy is not derivable. Um, so we need some other way of uh, quantifying our loss. And in this notebook or in this exercise, we rely on the so-called pointwise logistic loss. Again, 
For the whole derivation of how this formula comes to be, please consult the lecture slides. Um, we were just implemented here, so we have uh, y and c and a little bit of comments of what these stand for. So what we just need to do is implement this um, case statement. So there are two possibilities of implementing this. The first one is to explicitly check if c equals 1 and then if it's not, so if it's 0, um, we return the other part. However, um, this does not quite, well, it achieves what we want to do, but there's a more elegant way of, of implementing this um, because this loss function also extends to non-binary classification. So if we want to have a logistic loss, not for classification, but for regression, for example. So if you notice that 1 and 0 are by themselves sort of in if statements. If something is 1, then you can just multiply something by it and you get it. If you multiply by 0, it's not there anymore. So this case statement right here is equivalent to writing c times minus np dot log of y of x, and this y of x is actually our model function. And this model result, we don't need to compute it here directly because it's already given as the y prediction over here. And so if, just for clarity, let's put brackets around here. These are not needed because again, multiplying binds more than plus. But now we um, add to this one minus c, so the inverse of our label, times minus np dot log one minus y. And what this achieves is that there is one minus c and one c turn selectively turns off these two um, components. So if my class is one, this right here will result in zero. So this whole term is zero. So we only get this part of the equation. If c is zero, then this part of the equation is cancelled out and we are just left with this, which exactly achieves this um, case statement as up here. So this is our loss function. The next part that we need to implement is the convergence criterion. And um, convergence here means that since our BGD algorithm um, repeats computing a loss or computing a gradient rather and then shifting the weights we need some way of knowing when to stop and we could simply say okay we stop when we reached number n iterations so for example after 1000 iterations we just stop however this might run for too long in some cases um, we do redundant work because the weights might not change after iteration 100 uh, and we just spent 900 iterations computing something that we found uh, the optimum for earlier. The other reason is that um, 1000 iterations might not be enough. Um, so we could have fitted longer um, if we just used more iterations, but then again, we might run into efficiency issues. So there's a smarter way to check for convergence and that is using the loss gradient. So we see how much does the loss change? Um, how much do we shift the weights? And if the norm, so the reduced value of this value shift is under a certain threshold, so we do very little change to our weights um, because one property of these uh, iterative algorithms is that we move closer and closer to the optimum, so our actual change um, gets smaller and smaller in the weights. So we can use a property to detect when we are at a point where we don't really move anymore and uh, just stop there. Again, this convergence criterion is explained in more detail in the lecture. The lecture also gives us this formula right here to compute uh, this convergence. So again, we're just going to implement uh, the function as it's written here. However, um, we do one small difference to the lecture, and this difference is in this um, sum part right here. So the lecture asks us to, for the convergence, compute the norm of this vector right here, which is the sum of all the different uh, weights and 
the way they change regarding the true label. Um, and we could compute the whole sum at once, but there's one small trick we can use here to increase the efficiency. And as you might see, this sum basically iterates over all our examples in the data set. And if you look over to the right onto our BGD algorithm, it also iterates over all the examples in our training set. So if we just take out this inner part of the equation, which is the, I would call it pointwise uh, convergence or the convergence function for a single example only, and then do that inside our um, loop body in the BGD algorithm, we can then just sum this up in one loop and don't need to iterate over all our uh, examples again. Then we have the sum, and at the end we, we should not forget to actually take the norm of the sum to get the convergence value. Um, so what we need to calculate in this uh, function here is this part of the equation only, because all the rest will be done in the implementation of our BGT algorithm. So this is also rather straightforward. Uh, we have C minus the prediction, so Y, and this is just multiplied by X. And this uh, yeah, is the point, I would call it pointwise convergence um, or single example convergence function. Okay, now we have uh, our model function, we have our loss computation, um, which is happening right here, and our gradient computation, sorry. Um, and we have the convergence criterion. So now we have all the small parts that make up our um, BGT algorithm. So we are now prepared to implement it. And there's already some code here, and I will shortly explain what this code does. Um, these three lines basically allocate data that we need at some point during our training. So this is our data set as we give it to the BGD algorithm as a parameter. However, we have to add a bias dimension to the data. As you might recall, this uh, model function right here expects the, binary, uh, the, the bias term to be integrated into the writes and into the data itself. So we don't have this extra plus B that you might see on uh, other formulations of the same uh, model formula. Um, so what this function right here does is just add a column of ones to our data or to every single example in our data. So this is a list comprehension uh, which does something to everything in D, so every tuple X and C. We just leave the C as is and we add using this numpy edge stack function, um, we add a one to X and this will automatically get unpacked to adding a one as a column uh, to X. Then the second line here allocates a random weight vector um, and we take the shape of a single training example. Note that this shape, since we added an extra one, is also now larger than uh, if we were to compute it uh, before calling BGD because we modified the data set. And we just uh, put random values in there. Um, there is an argument to be made of putting specific random values in there, for example, random values that are uh, normally distributed, uh, which might converge faster, but just for simplicity, um, we just use random uh, values from zero to one in a uniform distribution here. And the last thing we initialize here is uh, a loss vector. So we need to keep track of our training loss at every iteration. So what we want to do here is just uh, give it, uh, take a zero vector from NumPy and uh, we are at most going to do the maximum iterations as specified above. So we can just allocate something that has the same length. Um, we might not need all of it, but as you might spot below, we later cap um, this loss vector to only contain the values that actually took place. So if our convergence criterion decides that after, I don't know, 250 iterations, we have reached uh, the optimal solution, then we only return the uh, top um, uh, 250 um, entries in this loss vector. And finally, this t is just our time step because we are not working with a for loop. Um, we could do for i in range max eater, but the, using this while loop is closer to um, how it's implemented in the lecture. So. Um, we have an infinite loop here that at some point we will break out of if we see that we have reached convergence.
Okay, so time to fill in this code. And we can basically step through the um, through the uh, lecture slide here and implement it line by line. So the first thing we do is increment our time step. So t equals t plus one. And we can write this as which sorry as plus equals one. This is the shorter version in Python. Uh, in, in something C, you would, for example, do T++. And we need to initialize our um, the, the delta of our V, uh, of our weights. So W delta equals zero. Now we reach the inner part of our um, of our training loop. And here we actually iterate over all the different uh, training examples. So we can do for x c in D, and this gives us a single training example. And now we first call the model function. So we do y, the prediction our model makes, equals model of y and c, uh, sorry, of uh, that way of w and x i was already one step ahead in my mind um because the second thing is to compute the loss and um this is not explicitly mentioned in the lecture slides um but we want to explicitly calculate the loss here so we can later visualize the training history um of how our model uh, fits over time so the loss will be inserted at the current time step um and this means that we can write into this uh, L array and just call the function loss of y and c. Then the next step is to, um, well, we could do it later, but I would do it now. So to keep the order of operations uh, closer to what they actually are. So we can increment our convergence criterion and actually I forgot to insert this up here. Um, this is also not in the slides, but we can. We need to keep track of, as I already told you above, this sum. And the sum is, this, uh, is a vector sum. So we need to initialize it at some point. Um, and it has the same shape as our weights. So we can just do np.zeros like the weight vector. And then add to this zero vector as it's now the convergence for this single example, so x, c, and y, um, which is the signature that we defined over here. Um, after the convergence, we can actually calculate the delta, so um, equals c minus y, um, which is just the difference of our prediction to the actual ground truth class. And finally, we calculate the delta for our weights. Um, so this is equal to this line down here. And we translate this uh, w equals w plus into the same plus equals Python notation as we did with the time step. Um, so now we have eta, which is our uh, learning rate. That is a parameter to the BGD function. And we multiply this by the delta as we calculate it over here and then multiply it by x. And this corresponds to this multiplication in the algorithm over here. Okay, that's it for our uh, inner loop. And we now update our global weights. So we do weights equal weight delta, which is the final part of our um, of our uh, failing. Actually, on second thought, we might move this down here because if we increment it before doing the inner loop, then the zero uh, index of the loss vector will never be touched and we might get uh, an index error in the last iteration because at iteration 1000, this will have run 1000 times. But since we increment it up here, it will actually try to access index 1001. Uh, so we move the... Um, the time step increase to down here, so this doesn't lead to an index error up here. Uh, sorry if that led to some confusion. And finally, uh, the last thing we need to do is check if we have reached convergence. So 
the lecture mentions that the convergence function can sort of take two exits. Uh, the first one is we have reached the convergence in terms of rates. So we take the um, norm of our convergence vector, so norm of conf. And if this is smaller or equal to epsilon, then we want to break out. The second criterion, and we can just connect them via an OR here, is if our t is equal or uh, larger than our maximum iterations. And then we also want to abort training. So in both of these cases, we want to just break. OK, um, we simply return the weights and also our loss history at the end. And this should be our complete. Uh, Oh, there's actually a syntax over here somewhere. Um, I will see if I can fix it for the uploaded version. Hmm. I'm not sure what goes wrong here, but let's just leave it there for now. Um, so this is just the function signature. I'm not sure why it doesn't render. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm just, just not worry about it. I think the uploaded version of the, yeah, now it works. Basically, I think it was just this new line, for example. I don't know. Um, so what we also want to do is do predictions. Uh, so we need some way of using unseen data or any feature vector that we might want to put into the model uh, to get a class level out of it. And right now, our model function up here only returns the sigmoid value, so a value between 0 and 1, which is a probability. But it's not actually the discrete class label we desire as output. Um, so what this prediction function should do is instead of outputting the probability, output the most probable label. Um, and we can do this by, um, again, taking this x input feature vector. And here we also need to remember to add this bias dimension. So we just do, and, and here, um, one thing to note is that x is a numpy uh, array itself. So we can directly modify it in the same way that we modified every single example up here. Um, so we basically reused this code, this edge stack, um, but we can directly operate on the whole set. Since if we want to predict, we don't have labels, so we don't need D, which is the combination of a feature vector and a class, we just need X, which is a list of feature vectors, or a multiset, sorry. Um, so we can just do uh, this, and we don't want to insert one, or a single one at the end, or at the beginning, um, but rather a column of ones throughout the whole set of feature vectors, so, so to every feature vector we want to add one. We could do this in a for loop or some kind of list comprehension, um, but I think it's just easier to construct an array of ones of the shape that we desire, which is um, the zero axis of our uh, X matrix, and then just append this or h stack it to x. And then uh, we want to return the class label. We could do something like for some for every prediction in model x or something and the weights. Um, and then do an if else statement to once again detect these cases. But there's a much faster alternative using NumPy built-in functions. So as you might remember, if else statements can be directly translated to a numpy.rare statement. So into this rare statement, we give the predictions the model makes for our feature vectors and the uh, choice of weights. And we check if this is larger than 0 0.5. If it is, we want to return 1. If it's not, we want to return 0. And this will now automatically scale um, to whatever number of feature vectors we put in there. Okay, now we have all the different uh, model parts implemented. And let's go ahead and try to test if this actually works. Um, we might get some errors up here. I'm not 100% confident that there are no implementation errors, but let's see. Um, so in order to test it, we first need data. And uh, we have provided you with some uh, existing uh, code to load a data set that's rather small that we can easily uh, fit our model onto on any hardware. Um, so this is the SKLearn Wine data set. 
And here you can see some information about it. So it basically characterizes, I think, about 180, uh, yeah, 178 wines into three classes using three, uh, 13 different attributes. And these attributes are, for example, the alcohol content, the magnesium content, uh, something like the color or the hue. And, um, if you have a look at this table, you can find more information also where it's from. Um, so let's load this data. And um, the one downside is that this data set has three classes. However, the model we just built is only suitable for binary classification. Um, so we need to somehow modify our data set so we only have a binary classification setting. Uh, we could do this by just removing one label. So removing every single entry in the data set that, for example, has label three. We could also do the more, um, we could also basically collapse two labels to make it. So right now we have a multi-class classification. Is it one or is it two or is it three? And we collapse label two and three into one single class. And so the question we want to classify becomes, is it one or not? Is it one or some other class? Um, so what we can do to achieve that is to just um, say that C, which is our, uh, I can just quickly print it here so you get an in, uh, an impression of how it looks. So this is basically, for example, one is class zero. Example two is also class zero. And this continues all the way up to example 100 and yeah, 178, which is of class two. And again, we can uh, use this numpy.rare syntax to say wherever C is equal to zero, we want to keep the zero. And wherever it is not zero, so all the other cases, all of these numbers, we want to insert a one. And this will transform our array so that we have the desired binary classification setting. So we have all zeros here, and this is everything that is not class one. Um, one other thing I want to highlight is, and this is a code we already supplied, is to have a look at the distribution of data. Um, and what you can observe here is that our different features, so feature uh, 1 to 13, um, well, it's 0 to 12, but basically the same thing, have vastly different distributions. So some features are only between 0.13 and 0.66, but some range all the way up to 1680. And this might be a little bit problematic for our classification, because if we have one feature that's drastically out of range, it will basically lead to our model not fitting as well, because this feature dominates our feature vector. So we need to it should arrive at the same um, conclusion at the end or the same uh, optimal weight vector, but the convergence will be much slower because the model needs to take, and I'm paraphrasing here what mathematically happens, but the model needs to make more steps in order to reduce the weight of this feature to an acceptable level. So the model needs to learn the scale of these features, not only uh, the classification. And this just takes longer. Um, but we can actually do some work beforehand to remove this variance in uh, feature distributions by using something called um, feature scaling. So what feature scaling does is it takes each feature on its own, looks at the distribution and standardizes it, uh, standardizes it, standardizes it. and uh, specifically we use z-standardization. What this means is that we take the distribution of, for example, uh, feature 0 or feature 1, um, and modify it in such a way or shift all the values and scale all the values. Um, and shift and scale are both linear operations. So we get um, the output distribution is uh, different by a linear factor or by a linear function. Um, so we don't actually do anything to the data that introduces some sort of data bias. We just squish it into um, a standardized distribution, which has a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. Um, if you already heard the uh, basics of probability lecture that we had, I think, last week, um, then you will already know what mean and standard deviation mean, um, or what the concepts behind those are. And so this uh, feature scaling might make more sense. And so if you haven't uh, 
if you don't really know what these two terms uh, refer to, go ahead and watch the probability basics lecture. Um, and on the upside, we don't need to actually implement the scaling, um, at least not in this exercise we could do, but I think it's out of scope. So we're just going to import from sklearn the standard solution for scaling, which is the standard scaler, um, which applies this Z standardization. And this code is also already uh, given in the notebook. And we can now see that all our values or all our features have compatible feature ranges. They still differ because the uh, deviation, uh, the standard deviation of each feature might be different, but overall they are in roughly the same, um, roughly the same shape or distribution or centered around the same uh, zero. So what's left to do for us is use BGD to fit the model to our data. Um, this means that we first have to assemble this D, um, which means that D is simply just zipping up um, X and C. So X are our feature vectors and C are our classes. And the way the lecture um, expects or the implementation which follows the lecture expects this data to be in is in tuples, not in two different um, sets. So zip just takes the first entry of whatever list you supply to it and put it into a tuple, and then a second to a tuple, a third into a tuple, and so on. Um, however, zip returns a generator in Python, so we need to call list on it to transform it into something we can actually use. Um, so I'll just shortly show it to you. Now, instead of having the feature vector and the class separate, they are now combined into one tuple for each of the training examples. And then we can call our BGD algorithm to get uh, both the rates and our loss history. We just call BGD on D. Um, there are some remarks here as to what values to use uh, for the hyperparameters. So we use uh, 1 to the power of minus 4 for a learning rate. We use 40 for the epsilon. And we only want to do about 1,000 iterations at most. And this is quite fast. Um, we could increase this to 10,000. Maybe then it will take a bit longer. Um, but we can see that something happened. Like these values are now our optimal rates. And what uh, is left to do is check if these rates are like how good is the performance that this model learned. Um, so you could implement, uh, you use the implementation that we did in the last exercise of evaluation metrics. Um, just to make this a bit quicker, I'm going to import them from sklearn, so from sklearn.metrics. And I'm also not going to implement the single uh, metrics, but just call the overall classification report, which basically does the heavy lifting for me and gives me um, a, a summarization of, of my classification result. So our true labels are this C, and for our predictions, we want to predict for our X and this choice of W. Uh, wait, classification report, I think I mistyped there. Yeah, now it should work. And we have some kind of error in there. Ah, okay. Our our predict function apparently has some error. Okay. As I said, I expected something to occur up here. Let me check what we did wrong. Um, ah, okay. So this is uh, just a matter of, I think I'm missing an index because it complains that the two things that I supply to this H stack have different shapes. And uh, they need to have the same shape here. So um, let's see where this goes wrong. So mp ones ah. So these ones are right now to demonstrate to you what the error was. So if I just call ones like this, I get five ones. But actually, I want to have a column of ones. So here, I would have to call uh, shape equals five comma one, which is basically the same data, but in column orientation, not in row orientation. And since we want to stack a column to our data, um, we need to do the same thing. And wait, uh, 
reformulate this part up here to also um, do the column orientation thingy. Um, and now this should work as expected. Let's try again. And perfect. We can see that our model actually performs quite well. We reach a precision of about 9.5, uh, a recall of 9.4, and this means also an F1 score of 0.4. Um, and this differs a bit by class, so we have a bit lower precision on classifying zeros than classifying ones, so everything that is not class zero. Um, if you want to gain some further insight into what goes on here, you might also um, plot the loss history. So this is the last thing I want to show you. So from uh, or import matplotlib. And I think I can just call plot on it directly. Let's see. Yeah. So this is our loss history, um, which is quite interesting because we see that our loss is decreasing. And then at some point it recognizes that, okay, we, we don't really move anymore so we might abort training so we haven't actually used all these iterations if you have a look here um we actually only did uh 258 iterations of training and then our convergence criterion uh decided that well we're not really doing anything anymore we might as well just abort it um one thing that the exercise also asks you to do is to play with these hyperparameters up here and see if you can um, improve the results. So, for example, what happens if you want to have it fit for longer? So not use 40 as a convergence criterion, but a lower value, because why it should then fit lower? Because it needs just to reach a lower threshold. It needs to reach it needs to reach a lower threshold. Um, to detect conversion. So if we just put 10 here, it should fit for much longer. And again, the, uh, the, um, the weights are slightly different now. And again, we can see that this actually increases our classification by a bit. We are now completely overfitting our data. Um, that's also one thing I, I forgot to mention before. What we do right here is we fit and evaluate only on training data. So we don't do any training test split um, in any real world classification setting you would uh, up here. Um, reserve some part of your training data um, to uh, to be not be seen by the model during training and then evaluate on this to see if you're overfitting. And if we reach a 1.0 on the training set, this means that or classifier is able to perfectly learn the relationships and the data. However, it might not be useful um, since this overfitting also means that on a test set, we probably get worse performance um, because we are so fine-tuned to the little deviations in the training data that our classifier is very accurate, but not very robust. Yeah, that's, that's all from my side. Um, I hope that you uh, found this helpful. If you have any questions, again, feel free to ask on Discord or in the next uh, in the next ex math exercise or lab session. And uh, yeah, see you in the next programming lab.